Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the National Firearms Centre, part of the British Royal Armouries in Leeds, and we are taking a look at one of the very first FAL rifles. Well, one of the very first batch ever to be made. So the background to this is, in 1945 the British government put together what it called the Ideal Calibre Panel. Uh, the British knew that they wanted to replace the Lee Enfield with a semi-automatic rifle in the aftermath of World War II. Really the only reason they hadn't done it during the war is cost and logistics. And of course they also recognized that the 303 British cartridge was completely obsolete by 1945. With, you know, it had, or it had originated as a black powder cartridge with a large rim, fairly heavy taper. This is totally obsolete, and it's not really well suited to box magazines in self-loading firearms. They made it work with the Lee Enfield and with the Bren, but things are a lot simpler with a basically straight, uh, non-tapered, rimless cartridge. So, uh, the Ideal Caliber panel is put together to try and pick, like, what should our next cartridge be? And it comes to the conclusion that 7mm is the ideal, di ideal diameter. And they put together uh, a pair, actually, two different 7mm cartridges. They are both 0.276 inch bullets, but just to, to keep confusion from rearing its ugly head, uh, they actually designate these cartridges one a 270 and one a 280. So they're actually the same diameter, but different names so people can keep them straight, which is rather thoughtful. Now, uh, the next step is going to, of course, be picking a rifle. And the idea is that um, whatever rifle they choose ought to be standardized throughout NATO, so that in the case of another future war, uh, NATO can have simple standardized logistics, as opposed to World War II, where the US was using 30-06, and the British were using 303, and the French were using 75 by 54 and Everyone has different cartridges, and logistics are really kind of a headache to try and operate uh, combined forces. So um, the British start doing some rifle testing. In 1947 FN provides them with a sample of its new rifle. Now what FN has basically done is taken Dudion Saif's uh, what was going to be basically the FN 49 rifle. He has spent several years in England during the war developing this gun, and it's it doesn't have a detachable box magazine, but it is a tilting bolt gas operated, uh, short stroke piston gas operated rifle. And they basically take that and kind of blend it with aspects of the German Sturmgewehr. So they give it a pistol grip, they give it a detachable box magazine, and at the very beginning here in 47 they actually chamber it for the 8mm Kurtz cartridge, the original intermediate cartridge. Uh, the British get this rifle, and they test it, and uh, they think, wow, this is actually a pretty nice rifle. However, we've decided that we want 7mm for our cartridge. And by the way, here's the cartridge we've designed, uh, which would ultimately be the 280-30. Um, they took... I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but basically in an attempt to compromise with the US side of NATO, they took the 7mm cartridge and redesigned it so that it had the same case, uh, case head as the T-65, the US submission to the trials. Um, and that became known as the 280-30, which is the cartridge that we'll be seeing the most of here. So anyway, getting back to our story, uh, the British go back to FN and say, rifle seems pretty nice, but we need it in 7mm, in 280 caliber. So FN scales the gun up a bit, redesigns it, beefs it up for that cartridge. This is, I believe, a 140 grain bullet traveling at 2330 feet per second. So it is a relatively light cartridge. It's still leaning towards rifle rather than pistol, if we look at it in terms of how intermediate is it. Um, but at 2300 feet per second it's substantially lower velocity, and thus also lower recoil, lower stress on the guns, etc. Um, it's substantially lighter than 30-06 or the T-65 7.62 NATO cartridge. Uh, and the British idea here is basically that they want to use one cartridge for a wide array of guns, everything from the soldier's individual rifle uh, through the automatic rifle, the replacement for the Bren gun, and the medium machine gun and vehicular mounted machine guns. They want them all to be on the same caliber, and that's going to be the 7mm. So FN delivers this rifle. Not necessarily this exact one, this is serial number 11, but FN delivers the first prototype, which is uh, actually the first of the rifles to be called the FAL, the Fusil Automatique Légère, the Light Automatic Rifle. And that's 
this guy, pretty much exactly as you see it here. There was some variation, they had one with a little bit longer barrel and no flash hider, they had one with a little bit shorter barrel, this is one with a flash hider, a little bit of variation, but mechanically speaking this is what they presented. And uh, at the same time the British government, or the British industrial uh, defense, the British, British Ministry of Defense is working on its own domestic rifle at the same time. So it's important to remember that while the British are very interested in the FAL, this is a Belgian designed, Belgian produced rifle. The British submission to the NATO trials was the EM2 bullpup. And in 1950 the first NATO rifle trial takes place, which is basically this rifle, the EM2 in 280, and the T25 rifle designed by um, uh, Har uh, Harvey Earl in the US, and that one was in T65, which is basically the name for the, the early version of 7.62 NATO. And in these trials the FAL actually comes out really well. Um, the British trials report thinks the FAL is great. The American trials report not so much, but the Americans don't really have a problem with the rifle here so much as they don't like the cartridge. And there are three main American complaints about the 28030 cartridge here, or the 280 cartridge. Um, the first one is what they called a zone of safety, and that is because this had a relatively low muzzle velocity, it had a very high trajectory. And the American ob objection was that basically if you were, if you had a target and you set your sights to 800 because you figured the guy's at 800 meters and you shot at him, but he was actually at like five or 600 meters, the trajectory of the cartridge is such that the bullet will go whizzing meters above the guy's head at five or 600 meters. And this was unacceptable because you didn't have enough margin of error in range estimation. Well, the British looked at this complaint and said, our sights only go out to 600. Like, we only intend this to be effective to 600. We'd never be shooting at someone at 800. And within 600 meters, there is no such margin of safety where the bullet's so high over the target that you'll completely miss someone like that. Uh, the second American objection was in very cold weather the muzzle velocity would drop even below 2300, which is true. Um, in cold weather your pressure drops, your muzzle velocity drops. And the US was anticipating a lot of cold weather combat when uh, the inevitable World War III against the Soviet Union was you know, fighting in the frozen Great North. So they were concerned that what was already an unacceptably light cartridge would become even worse in cold weather. And then thirdly, they argued that a 7mm in diameter bullet was not big enough to have the internal volume to make effective specialty cartridges, namely armor-piercing rounds, tracer rounds, and observation rounds, basically explosive rounds. Uh, all three of these objections in retrospect are pretty much hogwash. Um, obviously we have all of these sorts of specialty rounds in 5.5mm today, they work just fine in 7mm, but uh, largely this was the work of U.S. Colonel René Studler, uh, who was running the U.S. Ordnance Program for the new rifle, and he just basically had decided that the T-65 cartridge was what he wanted, the American rifle was what he wanted, and he wasn't willing to make any compromises. So uh, the British and the Canadians and the Belgians started trying to compromise in towards some sort of middle ground. The British really wanted an intermediate cartridge that would allow them to have a rifle that was actually like controllable in full auto from the shoulder, um, something much more akin to the AK or the German Sturmgewehr. They didn't know about the AK at this point, but bear with me. Uh, where the American cartridge was substantially too powerful for that. As you will find if you ever shoot an M14 in full auto, or like if you look at the British, who ultimately of course adopted the FAL in 7.62 NATO, they went ahead and adopted it as a semi-auto rifle only, having judged the full auto 7.62 NATO in the FAL from the shoulder to be uselessly uncontrollable. So um, at this point I think we should probably take a close, well no, let's, let's continue a little bit more. Um, so first trial in 1950, the US says 280 cartridge is crap, we don't want it, the rifle's not bad, cartridge is crap. Um, there are two follow-up British tests in 1951, one at a place called Pendine and uh, one at Warminster, which is the infantry school I believe, um, or defense college. It's the infantry school. Anyway, um, those two tests are just British internal tests. They're not interested in adopting whatever this American rifle is, and for good reason, it would eventually get dropped because it was crap. Uh, but they're testing the FAL against the EM2 in 280, and the Pendine test comes back pretty 
uh, conclusively in favor of the foul. The Warminster test comes back split 50-50. The British government looks at these results and decides to adopt the EM-2, on account of every EM-2 was equipped with an optical sight, and the rifle was shorter and a little bit lighter than the foul. So in mid-1951 the British formally accept and adopt the EM-2. Uh, Churchill then formally unaccepts it in December of 1951, on the basis of Churchill had, of course, some experience from World War II, uh, he had something to do with that conflict, and recognized the logistical issues that had been challenging for the British-American alliance in World War II, and realized it was more, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here a little bit, but almost certainly recognized it was more important to have the same cartridge between two countries, even if it was a worse cartridge, uh, just for the sake of logistical interchangeability. That would be more important if another war broke out than the minor, you know, the difference in a 90% effective rifle to a 97% effective rifle. So uh, Churchill figured it was more important to play nice with the American Ordnance Department, unadopted the EM-2, and set the stage for the FAL to ultimately be adopted by Britain and by the rest of NATO. Now, having gone through all of that, if you're still here watching, or if you fast-forwarded to this point, now let's go ahead and pull this apart and take a look at the inside. Despite the fact that this is an early prototype version of the FAL, it's actually really quite similar. Um, all the fundamentals are the same as the, the FAL that we know and love today. However, there are some details that differ. So uh, let's see, just starting off, we have a three position selector switch here. Uh, safe, uh, repetition, which is semi-auto, and automatic, A, full auto. We have a nice fancy FN. Uh, crest or logo here on top of the receiver. These of course were FN Belgian made guns. And similarly we have Belgian proofs here on the front of the receiver as well. And they went ahead and wrote the entire factory name out on the right side of the receiver. Fabrique, na Fabrique Nationale des Armes de Guerre Herstal Belgique. So the rear sight is virtually identical to what we would have on later standard production fouls. It is an aperture sight and it can adjust forward out to 600 meters there. So the, the base zeroing distance is 200. We have a blade front sight uh, that is side to side windage adjustable with a couple of little protective wings. We have our removable gas plug on the front, we'll take that out in just a moment. The magazine release is exactly where it would be on later guns. However, what's interesting here is that this is not a rock and lock style of magazine well. This is a straight in magazine well. And if you look at the magazine itself, you'll notice that the front lip, is, or the front strap, is completely flat. There is no front, uh, front magazine catch. We do have the rear catch here. In fact, the back of this magazine looks almost identical to a, a modern FAL magazine, as does the bottom and both sides. But no front lip. We have a charging handle with a little hook style of actual handle. Oh, and by the way, there's the serial number, 11. Uh, the, mag the bolt hold open is right here, so I can pull this back, lock it open. This is a non-reciprocating charging handle, so it stays in the front when you're shooting. And this has no way to manually force the bolt forward. Disassembly is basically the same as a modern foul. You've got a disassembly lever here, uh, although in this case you pull it down, and let's pull that back. This one's pretty stiff. There we go. Once you open that up, it just cracks the top and bottom, the upper and lower receivers apart. And then we can pull out the bolt and carrier, which look pretty much exactly like a modern FAL. Pull that out. There's our actual bolt. So it's a tilting bolt, locks right there at the rear. Bolt carrier, very much like a standard modern FAL. At the front end we have our gas plug. If we push this button in and then rotate the gas plug, there we go, 90 degrees, it comes springing out. So that's the plug itself. Note that there is only one gas port in it, so this does not have multiple adjustable gas settings. And then we can pull out the gas piston itself and its return spring. 
one cool aspect of this early prototype pattern that didn't end up on the, the final version is that it actually has this sort of removable inspection plate on the fire control group. So I can take the selector lever out like that, and then I can let's see if I can get it out here. There we go. There we go. It's got a lip in the front that you have to pull outward. But we can take this plate off, and then you can see the internal status of things like the sear and the hammer. That's just kind of cool. On the other hand, it's not really anything more than kind of cool, which explains why it ended up not making it into the, the final design. So last bit here, we have a split screw pin that holds the upper and lower together. So if we squeeze that together, and then unscrew it, we can pull out this side, and then push out this side. There we go. And then we can pull the lower assembly off the gun. So there is our early fire control group. Let the hammer up here. I'm going to do that carefully. The hammer spring is right here, and it's just kind of uh, held in... it's just leaning up in a little detent uh, in the back wall here of the grip assembly. So if you mess with this too much, this can pop out and go flying across the room. Um, in general, you know, none of these parts interchange with the, the modern foul, but the design concept is eh, pretty much unchanged. So what would eventually happen to this rifle? We know it didn't get adopted in the 280 chambering here. It would eventually morph into a slightly scaled up 762 caliber gun. But basically the 280 cartridge itself um, evolved over a couple of years in the early 1950s. It started with a relatively quite low muzzle velocity, 2330 feet per second, and over a couple iterations uh, the British and the Belgians would increase that muzzle velocity, trying to make it more acceptable to the Americans. So by the end of its development, it was the, the, the 280 or 7 millimeter high velocity uh, coming out of the barrel at 2670 feet per second. So they upped the velocity by like 15%. If we put that in pistol terms, uh, plus P is a 10% overcharge, and plus P plus is a 15% overcharge. So what they effectively did was turn 280 into 280 plus P plus, getting it actually starting to get really pretty close to 7.62 NATO uh, ballistics. But of course this would not be successful in appeasing uh, Studler and the American Ordnance Department. So. Ultimately, this rifle went by the wayside. The Belgian, Belgians, in response to an American request, designed a new version of this in 7.62, uh, the T65 cartridge. That would go into trials in 1952, and that's what would ultimately be adopted. So uh, we will take a look in a later video at a couple of the British, uh, the very early British 7.62 caliber FAL rifles, or SLRs. Um, if you are watching this when it first airs, that video is coming in the future. If you're watching this after it's been out for a little while, then uh, that video might very well have been published. So take a look at the end of this one, and if the British Experimental video is out, I will have linked at the end of this one. Uh, a big thanks to all of my patrons. It is your direct financial support that makes it possible for me to travel to places like the British Royal Armouries to show you awesome prototype guns like this one. Uh, and of course it is thanks to the British Royal Armouries that, uh, well, I need to thank them for giving me access to this thing, to pull it out and take it apart and show it to you guys. If you are doing firearms research, their collection is open by appointment. It's unfortunately not open to the general public. Um, however, it is located in Leeds at the Royal Armouries Museum, which is a quite large museum that's well worth your time to check out if you're in the city. Anyway, thank you very much for watching.